Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning thanking you for allowing us to be among the living. We thank you for the working limbs and organs in our bodies. Father, you are wonderful and glorious. Without you, we are nothing. We dedicate this time this morning to you and ask that you visit us during the study. Give us understanding and revelation. Holy Spirit, reveal things in us that we could not see before. Father, I ask that you use me as your vessel as I lead the study. I pray that each and every person that watches this live, later, or on YouTube is blessed by your word in this study. May we meditate on this word and make it applicable to our own lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, ladies. Good morning, Stacy. Good morning, Robin. It's been a while, but um, as you guys can see, I changed the schedule around just because I didn't realize how hectic everything would be because um, I still do like the YouTube and the blog posts and then I have book reviews and I'm also doing the chronological study with my sis Angela over in um, Transform Through God's Word, the sister group. So I didn't realize how much it was um, when I originally planned everything out. But when I sat and put everything on paper, um, as far as everything that I had to do, it just was a lot. And then we're also doing clean. And then I actually just started um, working in my church on the administrative department, in the, in the administration department. So it's a lot for me. And um, having my son when he was here, it was a lot. Uh, this is the last weekend that he'll be with his father and then he'll be back home five days a week. <laughs> so I just decided to go back to one day a week doing the, uh, Bible studies just because I noticed when I posted it up in the group, a lot of you guys were saying the same thing, like it was a lot or you were catching up and I never want this to be a, um, a situation not a situation, but I never want this to feel overwhelming to people. I don't feel like Bible study should be overwhelming, like, at all. I think Bible study is the most amazing thing in the world. And when it when it starts to become overwhelming, that's when you need to just take a break and take a breather. So that's what I did for myself. I took a while off um, with doing the John, and then I took some time off from blogging. Um, I still made my YouTube videos, though, but I took some time off from blogging. And I'll be getting everything back in order for August, so I'm working on scheduling everything in a better way. But, um, yeah, so we're going to be diving into John chapter 2. We should be able to get through all of it. Let me just move the mic over. But, yeah, we should be able to get through all of it because there's only 25 verses. So, hopefully that works out. And I think that's pretty much it. For those of you who will be watching this down the line later, I am using the ESV single column journaling Bible. I'm trying to get this in frame if it'll focus. No, you don't want to focus? Okay, there we go. So I am using the ESV single column journaling Bible from Crossway. That's the one that I use when I am doing these Bible studies. I prefer the New King James translation, but when I'm doing Bible studies like these, I prefer the ESV because it's an easier translation to understand. I'm using the Micron, the Pig One Micron 01 archival ink pen. This is a 0.25 millimeter pen, and I like it. It's nice, I guess. <laughs> I have my post-it notes, which are this little bird and um, this like thought bubble, speech bubble that I picked up from Dollar Tree. Then, of course, I have my Zebra Mild Liners, my Crayola Super Tips, the Twistables, and then also my Sharpie uh, Smear Guard Highlighters. So that's pretty much everything. And let's just dive in. So I'm going to start off by actually reading... Um, all of this first portion which is about the wedding at Cana so I'm hoping this is in view but um I'm just gonna read all of it through without any markings or stuff so let me just close my pen so it doesn't dry out but okay the wedding at Cana on the third day there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee the mother of Jesus was there Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples when the wine ran out the mother of Jesus said to him they have no wine 
And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water Yeah, there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding twenty or thirty gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now became wine, and they did not know where it came from. Though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This is the first sign. This the first of the signs, first of his signs, sorry, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. After he went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples and they stayed there for a few days. So I just read it through. So now what I'm going to do is, of course, the usual circle the words that I wanted to define. If I can find my notes. Here they are. Okay. So I only have two words that I circled for this first half. And those are Cana. Right? Yes. And Capernaum. And they're both basically a village in Galilee. That's basically what they both are. Um... I should have bought another post-it, but that's okay. Um, I'm going to write them on the side. So, so this one is village in Okay, hopefully that's in view for you. So, Cana is a village in Galilee, and Capernaum is a town of Galilee. So, those are the only words that I really wanted to define. Okay, trying to find somewhere to put this, but I'll have to just remember. Sorry, you guys, I'm just trying to put these somewhere so that I know what colors I use. I don't like to over use colors, so I just put them in a separate um, pen holder. But okay, so let's dive in. So on the third day, there was a wedding in Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. I did underline that the mother of Jesus was there. And, um, you know, it may seem like it's not a key fact, but his mother will be the one to basically kind of spur on the first miracle 
that takes place so I felt like it was important for me to underline that part and to understand that you know his mother was in attendance so I'm gonna write she was key to the first that's terrible handwriting but whatever miracle I'm hoping you can see that. Yes, okay. So, the mother of Jesus was there. She was key to the first miracle because she kind of, like, went to him and mentioned it that they didn't have any um, wine. So, let's go with, let's give his mother some pink, I guess. Let's give her some pink. Okay. Continue and it says Jesus was also invited to the wedding. So I'm going to underline Jesus also was invited with his disciples. So I underlined Jesus was also invited because um, it shows that Jesus was welcome among party goers. And I say that to say there are some Christians who... Um, you know, are like diehard Christians and they feel like they can't party. They feel like they can't go hang out. But that wasn't the case for Jesus. Jesus hung out with the party goers. He hung out with the prostitutes. Um, but in his hanging out with them, he didn't lose his character. So it's okay to hang out and party. Just don't lose who you are in doing so is what I'm getting from this part here. But, um... It just shows that he was welcome among party goers. I'm gonna have to get a post it. So I'm going to use the Sharpie pen. I'm gonna use a Sharpie pen um, to write on the post it just because the micron is a little too thin. So. You guys, I don't know if you can tell, but let me show you the difference between the two. Um, if you can see the nibs. I think the Sharpie pen, which is this black one here, is um, a 0.7 or a 0.8, whereas the Micron is a 0.25 millimeter. Though it is nice to write with, um, but Sharpie pen it is for me. So... So Jesus was welcome among party goers. And when I say it's okay to party, I don't mean like the hard, like the hardcore going clubbing and all that. I mean like if a friend invites you out to a dinner or if a friend invites you out to go bowling or something like that. Because I know a lot of people, um, I personally do know some Christians who will not go out with their friends. They won't go bowling. They won't go to the movies. They won't go to like a concert or something like that because they feel like it. I guess in some sort of way damages their relationship with God but that's not the case at all um now when it comes to like the clubbing with the alcohol and stuff that's a whole nother story <laughs> um yeah that's a whole nother story but in this case I'm talking about like the friendly type of outings that people can invite you to but you're quick to say no to so that's what I'm talking about in this case but the next part where it says with his disciples I underline that because um Jesus always had his disciples everywhere he went outside. Wait, hold on. I'm sorry, you guys. Yeah, basically that, yeah. So he did have his disciples everywhere he went outside of him praying alone. Um, and even when he would pray alone, he would have his disciples walk with him, you know, part way. And then he would still go off on his own. So Jesus r rarely went anywhere without his disciples. He always had them with him wherever he went, so...
Jesus always had his disciples. with him outside of praying alone no let's not use that one Moving on to verse 3, I underlined the part where it says they have no wine. Basically, Mary knew her son was not just hers, but truly God's. She went to him with the situation she knew he could fix, but she didn't force him to do it. She let him decide on how to, um, how to deal with it and if he would deal with it. So basically, she just brought it to his attention, you know, hey, they have no wine. And um, in other cases, like I can talk about like in modern times, there are parents who know that their kids are gifted and they will force their kids to do things. Like if you go to a party dinner and you know that your child can sing, you're going to push your child to sing. You know, you're not just going to say, hey, you know, you could sing. But no, there are some parents who actually force their kids to do things. In this case, it was not with Mary. Uh, Mary just basically brought it to his attention. Hey, you know, they have no wine. That was it. She left it at that. And that basically left an opening for him to basically decide if he would help them or not, if he would deal with it or not. So, verse 3, for they have no wine. Mary knew her son. Was God's. She brought the situation to him. Without forcing. She left it up to him. To deal with. So Mary knew her son was God's. She brought up the situation to him without forcing it. She left it up to him to deal with it or not. It was his choice. And um, let's highlight colors. Okay. Moving on to verse four. I'm underlining the part where he says, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. So I'm going to underline them separately. What does this have to do with me? And then my hour has not yet come. So when he basically many people thought that, you know, he was being disrespectful to his mother by saying woman instead of mother. But um, that wasn't the case. This was still a sign of respect though he did not refer to her as mother he basically could have been putting distance between them to spare her any suffering from the future events that were going to take place with his death because he was already aware that he would have to die for the people he knew that for a fact so um you know some people consider it to be disrespectful but in a way it could have been him just sparing her her suffering in the future but um woman was actually a polite form of address that he used to address women his use of word with his mother put things into a more formal stance rather than a personal relationship. Even with his family and friends, he kept his ministry at the forefront and separate. So, um, 
What I mean by that is there are some people who are in ministry who don't know how to separate the two from the family. Um, they always clash, whereas Jesus understood how to separate the two. He could have said mother, but he understood that he was in ministry now, so he had to say it a different way. And again, woman was not something that um, was meant to be disrespectful. If you look at, uh, there are like four other verses that I'm actually going to read where he had referred to other women as woman instead of saying their names. But that's verse four, right? Yes. Verse four. Um, woman was a form of a dress he used. His use of this word is this even in frame? Okay, just making sure. So his use of this word with her put things into a formal Dance and not personal he separated ministry from family and then the cross references I have for that are Matthew fifteen twenty-eight Luke thirteen twelve John four twenty-one and John twenty thirteen I'm going to check comments. <laughs> Good morning, Evelyn. Good morning, Candy. Hi, Michelle and Nicole. Good morning, Tanya. Yes, definitely, Robin. It definitely was considered a form of um, respect and address. As far as Jesus is concerned, I know that um, when he did say woman, he was speaking out of respect. So I'm going to read the cross, re cross references right now, but I'm going to go to my Nook on the Bible app if my Nook isn't dead. No, it's not. Lovely. I'm just uh, waiting for my nook to load <laughs> so that I can um, open it up. Okay. Bible. And my nook is going to die, so I need to charge that. So I need to take a sip of my coffee. Alrighty, so I'm going to go to Matthew 15, 28. If you have your Bible, you can definitely do that, of course. So Matthew 15 and 28. Now I have mine in the, in the New King James. I'm not going to change the translation um, of it. But 15, 28 here, it says, And Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as your desire. And her daughter was healed that very hour. 
So he's talking to someone and um, he calls her woman out of respect. The next one is Luke. Luke uh, 13 and 12. All of my notifications are just popping up on this thing. <laughs> I need to find a way to actually turn off the notifications, but um, here it says, but when Jesus saw her, he called to her and said to her, woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. Moving on to the next one. Um, and that is John 4 and 21, I believe it was, 421. Yes, it says, Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. So I think, if I'm not mistaken, this is when he was talking to the Samaritan woman at the well. Um, he referred to her as woman. And the last cross-reference was John twenty thirteen. And this is when the angels were actually speaking to Mary. Um, I'm actually going to read from 12 to 13. Um, so, and she saw two angels in white sitting. One at, I'm sorry. She, and she saw two angels in white sitting. One at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Um, she said to them, because they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. So, that's just to show that. You know, his use of woman was not disrespectful. Um, it was a form of respect towards his mother. And uh, so the next part was, my hour has not yet come. If I can pop my notes back. Okay. So basically, he was aware of the timing that God set for him to do a work. He was never out of sync with God's perfect timing or his will. And I think that's key because, um, you know, Jesus knew everything. So he could have already did everything that he wanted to do. But he wanted to make sure that he was aligned with the um, timing of God. He never went out of timing with God. He never went out of sync with God. Um, and I feel like that's something that I personally want to take away. Because there are things that I know that I need to do. And instead of waiting for God's perfect timing, it's kind of like I'm rushing it like um, concerning my relationship and also concerning work. I know that I want to work and um, God has opened up doors for me to work, but the timing for work isn't right. So me rushing it only makes the um, disappointment greater for me. And then concerning my relationship, um, my fiance and I have been together come September. It'd be uh, six years come September. We've been engaged now for five years. We should have been married back in 2015 and then we pushed it to 2017 but it just it hasn't happened and I know that if I was to keep pushing it my fiance and I probably either would have been very miserable in our marriage or we would have been divorced and um I'm kind of grateful that you know though I was rushing it it didn't work out because um, God is definitely doing a work within our relationship and within me and within him as individuals. So um, just staying in sync with God is like important. And I think that's definitely a big takeaway for me in this verse is that um, I need to always make sure that I'm mindful and in sync with God's perfect timing. Not good timing, not okay timing, but perfect timing and making sure that it's God's perfect time and not just my own. But um that's that. So I'm going to write that note here on the side. Hopefully there's enough space. But, um, he was aware. Of the timing. God set. He never was out of sync with God's perfect timing.
Okay. And I'm going to use this pretty, pretty green color because I'm obsessed with this little color here. It's so pretty. I just love the way it looks. check you guys comments quickly all right so moving on to verse five I'm just going to underline the part when um, Mary says, do whatever he tells you. And I'm going to use orange for that. Take a post-it note. And what I'm going to do is stick the post-it notes on the back of this page um, here. Most likely, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. Okay. So, for the part where she says, do ever... Do whatever he tells you. Basically, Mary glorified her son. She knew he had power and told the servants to do as he said. She knew he would give an impossible solution to a problem at hand. This also shows her confidence in him and the approval of his independent action. She understood that he was her child, but he was also the son of God. So, um, in her telling these servants to do whatever he tells you, one, she had faith that he would find a solution. Two, she understood that his answer to the solution, I'm sorry, the answer to the problem would be something that an ordinary person could not do. Third, she understood that though he was her son, he was still the son of God. And that was more prominent than him being her child. So, and it shows her approval of his independent actions because a lot of parents don't accept when their kids do things on their own so i thought that was really key and important to grab from that verse so um she glorified her son who was jesus christ she very glorified son she knew he could that he could bring an impossible solution she had great faith in him And knew he was the son of God. Let me just write chapter 2 so that I know when I stick this on the back. Okay. So basically Mary glorified her son. She knew that he could bring an impossible solution. Um, meaning that she understood that his solution would be something that man could not do. She had great faith in him, obviously, because she told these people, like, hey, do whatever he tells you to do, and she left it at that. She never argued with him. She never bickered. She never pushed. She had faith that he would bring an answer to this problem, and she knew who he was as the son of God. She understood that he had all power. She understood that, um, you know, though he may be man, he really was gifted and blessed, and, yep, yeah, that's pretty much what I got from that, so I'm just going to stick it up here for now. 
moving on to verse 6. It says, Now there were six stones of water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification. So I'm going to underline there were six stone water jars. And I'm going to underline for the Jewish rites of purification because I think those two are key. And when I first read this, I really didn't think anything of it. Um, honestly, I just read it like, okay, that was that. It is what it is. I mean, he had it there. Okay. But it wasn't until I studied it, looked at, looked up, looked at commentaries, um, looked in all of my Bibles. I looked in every single Bible that I have. I looked online. I looked in commentaries. Like, it wasn't until I actually fully studied verse 6 that I finally understood why it was so crucial. Um, and it's things like that when you just study it normally, you can bypass some crucial points. Um, so... Let me just underline that in blue. And use this green that I love so much. I just, I love this mint. I like that blue and I love this green. Like, those colors are just thinking adorable to me. Like, I love them so much. So, where it says, now there were six stones of water. Sorry. Sorry about that. But um, now there were six stone water jars. So I'm going to write verse 6. And I use this gorgeous green color. Get my notes back. Um, okay, so. Now there were six stone water jars there. So basically, instead of making a lavish show of his power, Jesus used what was at hand and what was available. And um, that stuck out to me personally because I know for me, when someone asks me to do something, I don't like to use what's available. I like to go, and it's not to make a show of it, but I like to go and get new things and make it, you know, really nice and extravagant instead of just using what I already have that is in front of me. And I think that a lot of people do that. We don't really realize what's available in front of us, um, especially with our gifts that God gave us. For me personally, I know that I have um, the ministry of dance within me. Dancing has been my life. Like dance is something that I love. It is my life. I've done it since I was a baby. Like it's everything to me. So if someone asks me to dance, that's no problem. But when somebody asks me to like write something or they ask me to do something else um, where I know that I'm gifted, but I don't really use that gift a lot. I get a little nervous and I feel like I have to be extravagant with it, but that's not the case. Use what you have, use what's available in front of you instead of trying to go out and get other things to make it look, you know, extravagant and lavish. You don't have to do that. And that's definitely what Jesus, um, Jesus didn't do. He basically used what was right there in front of him, which were six stone water jars. That That's what he used. He didn't say, go get me some gold jars and talents and all this. No, he stuck to what was there and what was available. So I'm going to write instead of making a lavish show. of his power he used what was available at hand he didn't seek out anything extra he used what he could what was right in front of him and that was enough for him and that's something that I want to keep in mind, that what I have is enough. I don't have to go out and be extra. I don't have to go out and get new things. I can just use what I have and be okay with that, be content with that. And, um, you know, John chapter 2 is not a lot of verses, but there were things that actually did stand out to me for myself personally. 
But um, the next part of that verse says, for the Jewish rites of purification. So those six stone water jars that he saw were used for the Jewish rites of purification. Now, these water jars were connected to the law as they were used for ceremonial purification. This is an act, the new covenant, overpowering the old covenant. And like I said, it wasn't until I dig, dug, dug, dug deep and really did some research on verse 6. Because I knew that verse 6 was important, but I felt like it wasn't important. So after I did my research, it really was like a slap in the face in a good way. Um, because these water jars that he was getting ready to do to use for his miracle um, were connected to the law. And if you noticed, everything in the Gospels um, is like Jesus, the new covenant, versus the law, the old covenant. And this is just the beginning of it all happening. Um, and I, I, I don't know, I just thought that was amazing to me personally, to see that um, this is kind of like the new covenant overpowering the old covenant. So, the water jars, oops, sorry. Water jars connected to the law. This is the new covenant. Overpowering the old. I do have some cross references, um, which are Leviticus chapters 13 to 14 and then Hebrews 1 and 3. And I'm not going to read all of Leviticus chapter 13 and 14. That's just way too much. But um, I'm going to turn to it quickly on my nook. So Leviticus chapter 13, um, it's all about the laws concerning leprosy. And the rituals for cleansing hill leapers. Um, and in that they use those water jars to do the cleansing with the water and stuff like that. And then I have Hebrews 1 and 3. And let me just show you guys quickly. Um, so I don't know if you're going to be able to see it. Uh, okay, yeah, you can see it. So chapter 14 is the ritual for cleansing healed leapers. And then 13 is the law concerning leprosy. Um, and as you read it, it talks about the cleansing and what they have to do and all that stuff. So going on to Hebrews 1 and 3 is what I found. Yeah, okay. So, let me just write Leviticus 13 and 14, and then Hebrews 1 and 3. So, Hebrews 1 and 3 reads, um, Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had... When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high so um this is about basically jesus christ purging our sins and that's kind of like um what the six stone water jars did for the jewish rites of purification they purified and purged whatever was going on with the leapers um and that's basically what jesus did for us he purified us he purged our sins so the connection in that was pretty interesting to me Moving on to verse 7. What time is it? Okay, it's 1049. We're doing good. Verse 7 said, Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. I'm underlining that. Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. I'm going to underline they filled them up to the brim. Now, Jesus gave one simple command, you know. Fill the jars with water. Um, and that simple command would lead to a miracle. 
he all he really needed was the servants to cooperate with him jesus understood that um sharing in the work meant sharing in the blessings so though alone the servants efforts are insufficient their obedience would allow them to experience the joy of the miracles to come and i have all of this on the principle so don't worry i'm just making sure let me just do it this way uh oh what's going on what's going on okay sorry guys i'm just trying to get this to say like this so that i can see everything while still looking at my notes okay wait zoom back up um Okay. and is the audio fine you guys i mean i'm gonna edit the audio when i go to upload it onto youtube but i just want to make sure if the audio is okay for you guys so verse seven let's put the nook over there Fill the jars with water. So Jesus gave a simple command. The servants only needed to cooperate um, in order to share in the blessing. And experience. miracle so jesus gave a simple command the servants only needed to cooperate in order to share in the blessing and experience the miracle i did not mean to throw that like that <laughs> part where it says they filled them up to the brim the servants had to have faith in what jesus said and they may have thought him crazy but they obeyed his words and filled it to capacity so they didn't just look at him like okay why are we filling this up if we need wine why water they obeyed him their obedience showed that they had great faith in him so that's important they obeyed why am I writing in this pen? Lord Jesus. <laughs> Wrong one. They obeyed and showed great faith. And I say that because they didn't just fill it up halfway. They didn't fill it up close to the top like now they filled it up to the brim they didn't uh waver in what it is that he told them to do they just did it obeying him which showed great faith um 
Okay, thanks, Stacy. Moving on to verse 8. Now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. I'm going to underline that. So they took it. I'm going to also... It's two separate um, underlines, obviously, but uh, for some reason it just went together. So... I'm going to line, so they took it in green... And this lavender for the other portion. Uh -oh. Now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. What just happened to my notes? <laughs> okay. So, again, this took faith on their behalf because they only saw water. Um, so, I'm sure they pretty much looked confused. Because if it was me, honestly, I'd have been like, why am I drawing out water to give to the master if we need wine? I would have questioned him. I would have doubted him. I would have thought he was crazy. But um, these servants just, they did what, you know, they did what he said. They, they had to have faith in order to just take the water to the master. So, this would take faith, because faith is a substance of things um, unseen. So, they see water. That, 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 that's, at least that's what I'm seeing that they see. They, they see that they filled up the water jars to the brim with nothing but water. Now, Jesus is telling them to take some of that water out and bring it to the master what could you possibly do with water water is water at least in our opinion but only jesus and god has the power to turn water into wine so this would take faith to draw water and take it to the master So they took it. They obeyed Jesus in faith. That That's pretty much all there is to it. Whether they knew it was faith or not. Um, now they could have been scared to disobey him since, you know, his mother said, do as he said. Um, and they were servants. But even though they were servants, they still had to have some type of faith for it to work. Um, you, you really need faith to see the miracles happen. And... Um, it doesn't have to be this huge type of faith. The Bible says faith the size of a mustard seed. And a mustard seed is pretty small. So they had to have some type of faith in them to do whatever work he was telling them to do in order for the miracle to take place. So they obeyed. In faith. There was no questions. There was no doubting. There was no, are you sure this is what I need to do? Like, they just, they looked, did it, and it was what it was. So moving on to verse 9. When the master of the feast tasted, the water now became wine. So I'm going to underline the water now became wine. Then I'm going to underline um, the part where it says, though the servants who had drawn the water new so 
So the water now became wine. This was the first miracle to take place, but only a few saw this miracle happen. So basically what this says to me is that everyone won't see the miracles in my life, but the few who do should be faithful to believe. Um, verse 9, right? Yes. First miracle few saw. So the first miracle miracle and few saw everyone will not see the miracle in my life. It's pretty much what I got out of it. Um everyone will not be able to see the miracles that take place and that you know it it's hard for us to accept that because we like to show people things and it's not always about boasting but we like to share it with everyone and I think that's something that I deal with um for myself but in the opposite way for me I like to share my problems with everybody and tell everybody everything but I know that I can't because not everybody is going to be as um believing as I am they're not going to have as much faith as I am and some people do want to see your downfall unfortunately so this really just shows me that not everybody can see the miracles that are taking place in my life and I'm learning to accept that um as you know I go on in this life because there are some people who just want the worst for you there are some people who don't want the best for you so though the servants who had drawn the water knew Basically, the servants were the only ones who knew that the wa that the jars were filled with water. Um, they partook in the miracle. Give me one second, guys. Let me just ask them to keep quiet. All right, ladies, sorry about that. Um, so, those the servants um, who had drawn the water knew. So, like I was saying, um, the servants were the only ones that knew the miracle that took place. So, they had that opportunity to partake in the miracle. And I honestly can't say anything else about that verse. I mean, that's pretty much it <laughs> that I wrote about that. So what I'm going to do is actually take these notes and start sticking them on this back page here so that I will know what needs to be done. Okay, so let me write that sideways if I can without making a mess. Um, only thing I'm writing is that only they knew the miracle. I'm not sure if you can see that, but um, because they were the only ones to see it actually happen. I'm pretty sure the, the 12 disciples did too, but. Uh, moving on to verse 10. I'm going to underline the part where it says, Everyone serves the good wine first. And when people have drunk freely than the poor wine but you have kept the good wine until now underlining but you have kept the good wine until now and i'm gonna use blue and i'm gonna write my note here 
Oh, just had to check something. Okay. So, but you have kept the good wine until now. Basically, with his power, Jesus didn't just make common wine. With the few words that he spoke, he created good wine that astonished the people. So, anything God does, anything that Jesus does is not common. It will always be spectacular. And if you've been blessed by either one of them, you know that everything that they do is spectacular. So... He didn't just make common wine. He created good wine that astonished the people. I'm thinking about going to the library today. I don't know why. I'm just in a mood to just go to the library and get some work done because I feel like when I'm home, I can't do as much work as I would like to do. But it's just been raining all week, so I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like I should just to get some like blog posts and stuff done, some editing done. It's been a while since I've just taken a trip to the library. I love going to the library. I'm a book nerd at heart. Like if I could just have one whole like master bedroom with nothing but bookshelves and a desk, I would be content with life because books just make me happy. I love reading. I love writing like it. I'm a book nerd. But I don't know, I'm debating if I want to go today or tomorrow. Because I still have to record a few videos today. Ugh. So we'll see, we'll see. And if it's raining, I'm not going to go. But um, that was so off topic anyways. <laughs> um, Moving on to verse 11. This, the first of his signs. I need to edit my notes because my notes are just in different translations. And that's not good. So I'm underlining this, the first of his signs. I'm underlining manifested his glory. And then I'm going to underline his disciples believed in him. I'm going to keep going to verse 12. That's, no, actually, no, I don't have anything for verse 12. So, yep, that's it. So, I also underlined manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. That's what I underlined. Let's get some color on this page. Because I can't see anything that I just did. Manifested his glory. His disciples believed in him. And... Let's go with this color. Actually, no. Let's go with some orange. This, the first of his signs. Okay. And we're going to use post it. So, verse 11. This, the first of his signs. Um,. This was the first of the seven miracles to take place by the hands of Jesus. It's the old ways of law, ceremony, and purification converted to new life through Jesus. Hopefully that just made sense. But of seven miracles, seven signs, seven wonders, however you want to say it. I always say seven miracles. Um, It's the old ways converted to new life through Jesus. So 
Uh oh. Okay, so manifested his glory. Um, in his first miracle, he showed himself as a son of God with power and authority. So, in this miracle, he showed himself. As a son of God. With power and authority. And then verse 11 again for where he says his disciples believed in him. Actually, I'm going to go back to this verse because I have cross-reference for that. So, manifested his glory, I do have cross-references for that. Which is 2 Corinthians 4 and 11. Sorry about that, you guys. 2 Corinthians 4 and 11. So, for, who we, for we who live are always delivered to death. For Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. And then 1 John 1 and 2. I don't know if you guys can see that. Let me bring this down a bit. So, I'll read it again. It says, For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. And then I'm going to read 1 John One and two, and it says the life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you the eternal life, which was with the father that was manifested to us. Um, and personally, I love that John pretty much uses himself to prove himself, if that makes sense, because first John, first John, second John, third John and Revelations are all written by um, the Apostle John. So I just think it's amazing when um, it just proves itself throughout scripture. I don't know. Maybe that's just me, but I like looking at stuff like that. Um, but again, those cross references are 2 Corinthians 4.11 and 1 John 1, 1.2. Those are actually on the printable. So the part where it says his disciples believed in him, it took him doing a miracle for them to believe in him. This is a tip this is basically typical of us as Christians. We believe in him consistently over and over again when we see him do something miraculous in our lives. And unfortunately it's the truth. Um, you know, some people say, Yeah, I believe in Christ, I believe in him, but it's not until he does a miracle that you truly, truly believe in him. And of course we need to not be uh I guess think that way, but that's just the way the world works, unfortunately, and how humans tend to think because we are so limited in our thinking because there are times when i'm like yeah i believe him but then there are times when miracles don't happen and i start to question and um it's typical of us to do that a lot of people do do it and it is what it is a lot of people don't talk about it though because people are um afraid to be shamed or to speak on it but like I kept saying, it is what it is. Sometimes we just, we feel like we need something more to believe in him. We need to see a miracle or a sign or a wonder or a dream or a vision to really believe in Jesus when that's not the case. We shouldn't believe in him because of that. We should believe in him because of who he is, not what he does for us. And um, I'm, I'm learning that every day for myself that I need to just trust and have faith in God and Christ um, for who they are and not what they can do or what they have done. You know, those are both benefits of what they have done, what they're doing, what they're, they're planning for me. But um, who they are to me is enough for me. Is That's what I'm learning and finding out nowadays, that it's enough for me of who they are. They're my provider. They're my protector. They're a friend. They're a comforter. Um, they're a shield. They're a refuge. Like, who they are to me is enough rather than what they can give me and what I can benefit from, if that just made sense. But um, it took...
Jesus doing a miracle. For them to believe. Christians need signs and wonders to believe in him. Okay, so we're done with the first part of um, chapter 2, which is about the wedding at Cana. So now we're going to be going into the second part, which is about Jesus cleansing the temple. And, um, yeah. So I'm going to read verse 13 to, what is that, 22? Okay, so reading... Yes, they see. Um, I think a lot of us do. I know I have in the past, um, especially recently with the whole job situation. Um, you know, I I definitely felt doubtful after that. And then I saw some things on like social media that started to make me doubt and it's it's not a good feeling. But um, you know, we're we're only human. God knows that we're human, you know, it he, he created us. He knows that we're going to have moments of doubt. But I think the key is not to linger in those type of things. Don't linger in doubt. Don't linger in fear. Because it's inevitable. We're human. It's going to happen. But, um, you know, he doesn't want us to just stay in that position and just linger. He wants us to get out of it. So, we, we've all been there. At least I have. So, I don't know if anybody else has. But I've, I've been there with you. <laughs> but, um, okay. So... Starting with verse 13. And let me go back to my notes so that I can go back to my definitions. Okay. Verse 13. The Passover of the Jews was at hand and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen, sheep, and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the... I'm not sure how this is going to work. Sorry if you guys see this wire in the front. Uh, I'm trying to move it so it's not in the front. Because I have my mic attached to my phone. But, uh, trying to get this to work. So hopefully that works. Okay. That should be better. But I'm um, trying to get this back in frame. Is this in frame? No. Okay, there we go. So it ended with... Uh, and making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. He poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned the tables. He told those who sold pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. Verse 18. So the Jews said to him, the Jews said to him, what sign do you know? Sorry, what sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple in three days, I will rise it. The Jews did said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple. And will you rise it up in, will you rise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. I'm going to read the last paragraph after. But, um, going back, going back, I'm going to circle the words that I needed to define, and I think all those words were on the back. Yeah. So, um, the words that I circled are overturned, where that is, overturned. Zeal, consume, mm. 
destroy. And obviously these are words that I know, but you know, I definitely did want to um, define them deeper. So overturn, the Greek word is, I can't pronounce that. So we're just going to write it up here. Greek word is Anna. I need to eat a muffin because my stomach is just going off. Okay. In a trepo. I don't know how to pronounce that, but meaning to destroy. Obviously, in English, I just like to flip over. So he destroyed the tables by flipping them over. Moving on to zeal. The Greek word is zelos. So zealous meaning eagerness, enthusiasm, jealousy, or rivalry. Consume is, I can't pronounce that word either. <laughs> Like, I just, I'm not good with these Greek pronunciations. Everything is on the printable, you guys, so. But you can always just look it up on either Bible Hub or Blue Letter Bible. Okay, you know, people don't know how to not be loud. <laughs> but um it is cats she i don't i don't really yeah i'm not gonna attempt it you guys i, I was but k-a-t-e-s-t-h-i-o catchio and it's to eat up To eat up, devour, annoy, or injure. Eat up, devour, annoy, or injure. And destroy is... L Lou? Lau? I, 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 I don't know. <laughs> I am terrible with it. It's L O. No, L U O. With a little mark. Um, meaning loose. Release. Break up. Demolish. Or dissolve. Okay. Let's circle some of these words. And I'm going to use this pack here. I think this is the warm pack. From um, the Zebra Mount Liners. 
gonna just use these to do what I need to do. I'm gonna use this gorgeous yellow for this over here. I am thinking about getting the fourth pack. I can't wait. Because there is a fourth pack coming um, that's already out. And it has like a darker gray color and some like other pretty, pretty colors. So I'm debating on getting that color, those colors. I'm, I'm really debating on it just because I have so many. And I also have a pen case coming. Um, I know she's in the Facebook group. Oh my God, I can't remember her actual name. But on, on Instagram... Her um, Instagram is Counting the Cost Ministries, and she had posted a picture of her doing her, I think it was verse mapping, and in the verse mapping, she had a photo of her uh, Papermates Inkjoy gel pens in, like, this case, and I was on a hunt for that specific case because it's so pretty, the blue, but um, I ended up just getting a black one. Um, so I'm going to get the black one. I'm probably going to have to order another one because I have so many pens, <laughs> like, way too many pins i need to charge my nook because it's going to die but um yeah i just ordered that so that's actually coming today because it came from illinois so it took three days though i had two day shipping amazon prime but um yeah i'm gonna be doing a video soon on my youtube channel about my like bible study essentials and the way i have my pins and stuff is like a hot mess i have okay so i have this holder here I have another holder that I actually have my mic in right now. I have this one. I have a second pink one. So I have like two of these black ones. Two of these. And then I have a silver one. Then I have pencil cases. Then I have this pouch that I have. The like I just have things all over the place. And I really want to get organized to where I can just have one place for all my highlighters and pens. For when I'm doing Bible study, journaling, planning, whatever. So that's coming and I can't wait. And I'm probably going to order a second one like most likely we'll order a second one in the gray color who knows i don't know but off topic anyways i'm sorry i thought this was in view i'm so sorry guys i really thought this was in view as i was writing um but i see that it wasn't um let me scroll down Okay, guys, I'm just checking the comments. So, Robin, what did I say on the first part of 11? Give me a second and let me go back. Let me go back. So, for verse 11, um, I underlined the part where he says this is where it says this is the first of his signs. I said that um, it was basically the first of the seven miracles that took place by the hands of Jesus and that it was the old ways um the old ways basically of law, ceremony, and purification that converted to new life through Jesus. That was the first part of um, verse 11. Evelyn, um, yeah, we all doubt. It's hard. It, it's definitely one of those things we all struggle with. And the notes, um, what I do with the notes is I upload them after the session only because sometimes there's like mistakes <laughs> in the notes and I'm one of those people I love writing so I'm one of those people who don't like to have a lot of mistakes and sometimes I end up changing my thoughts so I don't post the PDF printables until after the session so that if I do have to change anything around I can go and change that around and then upload it um you're welcome Robin do those highlighters bleed through are you talking about the zebra mouth liners um i don't find that they bleed through i mean you can see ghosting but i think any highlighter will bleed through if you um well these are not the highlighters but i don't know if it's like you can see oh no you can't if you can see here um i don't know i don't consider it bleed through it's more so ghosting there will be bleed through when you like leave it for a long time obviously with, with anything but um I'm trying to see if I use it anywhere else. Okay, let me go to show you quickly.
Yeah, so I did use it on um, this page here. And let me try to show you. I don't want to rip it. <laughs> trying to take it off without like ripping it come on you can come off I'm probably gonna have to put paper in between and then I don't know I'll have to figure something out because I get nervous but um I don't know if you can see it like there's ghosting this part goes on the other side of the page with that but um, there's no bleed through. And I think that's why I really like these highlighters. Because there's no bleed through. Like at all. None whatsoever. And I love it. Okay. So let's stick this here. Because there's no bleed through. And I just totally lost where I was. But here we go. But yeah, there's um no bleed through with these. There is shadowing with any type of marker i think in a bible i mean there's just no getting over the shadowing but as far as like is it going to like seep through the pages no i've never had that problem with it seeping through the pages and if it did it was only because i held the marker in a spot too long like here you can see like it's coming through the page but that's only because when you highlight you have to highlight and then like you know you leave it at a, I don't know how to explain this. I'm going to show you because <laughs> it's kind of hard to, to explain it. But like when you highlight, you know how you, you drop it there. It's kind of like that when you press it too hard at the end or at the beginning. That's pretty much all there is to it. Um, but there's no bleed through. I love these markers to death. It's okay, Evelyn. No problem at all. You're welcome, Robin. Yeah, like that's definitely it. You definitely get um like if you press too hard, I make sure I use a light hand. Um, because if you do press too hard, you're gonna get like even on this post-it note, um, you can see shadowing. And there's like almost a minimum bleed through. But on this you definitely can see the shadowing. It it just it is what it is with I guess any type of marker. Um, like with these microns, people told me that there was no bleed through and there was no ghosting. You definitely can see ghosting, and especially like down in this area. I think because I was pressing too hard. <laughs> um, you can kind of sort of see it. I don't know if it's popping up on camera. Yeah, so like right here is this marker here, but um, here it's just ghosting, but this part is kind of almost like bleed through just because I was pressing too hard. And like I was saying with this, there's the ghost. You can see it. The bleed through was like almost right there. But I mean, just don't press too hard and you you should be good. But I do love these. Like, I love these. And these work great in, um, like, books and study guides that have, like, that really nice paper. Oh, my God. They work so, so good. But in Bibles, I mean, everything is going to bleed. It's a Bible. The Bible paper is just thin as it wants to be. So. <laughs> but, okay. What time is it? It's 11.33. Okay. We're doing good. We're doing good. Um, I might extend it to 12.30 if we're not done by 12. But, okay. So. My words are defined. Now we're gonna go to 13. You can get them, they actually do sell them in Target now, but um, you can definitely go on Amazon and get the three pack or the four pack. Am Target sells them in the 15 pack. So like when I bought mine from Amazon, I got these three here together as a set for about 13 bucks um 13 and some change so maybe 14 dollars um together in a set amazon app not amazon oh my god amazon has them like this um they come together like in a package but they're in individual kind of like containers um if you go to target you can get these together in like a container kind of like how they do the um where is it they basically come like this, but in a in a packaging similar to the Sharpie art pens in a container um, that you can get. But there is a fourth pack out, and um, I'm I'm thinking about getting it, but I don't know yet because there was a lot of uh, conspiracy on YouTube about the zebra the zebra mild liners fourth pack. But um, I'm thinking I'm gonna get it. But yeah.
that was just so random <laughs> but yeah definitely check amazon or target um if you want to go in person to get them evelyn target um even the target website they have them on target for i think 16 bucks um, on the website so in person like in the store they might will they'll probably be about the same um price but amazon has them i think they're like 14 now but i paid 13 when i got mine so amazon and target are the only two places you can probably check ebay too but amazon and target are your best bets okay so Um, 13, 13, 13. Okay, so 13, the Passover of the Jews was at hand. That's what I underlined. The Passover of the Jews was at hand. And then Jesus went up to Jerusalem. So, the Passover of the Jews was at hand. Many people were in Jerusalem abiding by the laws and many not. And then I have Exodus 12 and 11 for that. So, um... Many people in Jerusalem abiding by law and some not. I have Exodus twelve eleven and then Deuteronomy. 16 1 through 6 i'm not gonna read them those cross references but they're about um passover and the laws and stuff like that of passover so again you can read exodus 12 and 11 and deuteronomy 16 1 through 6 to um get more information about passover but i'm just i'm not gonna read it Jesus went up to Jerusalem. He went every year with his parents, but this year he had a purpose to go there. Everywhere he went was for a greater reason than the eye can see. So people just are most likely seeing him go just as he normally would traditionally. But this time around, he went for a specific person, as it says, Jesus cleanses the temple. So he didn't just go to Jerusalem as part of like routine going with his family. This is something that he did to... Um, how can I say it? He went for a purpose, like a true purpose. So he went to fulfill a purpose. So, verse 14, in the temple, and I'm underlining in the temple from verse 14. So, in the temple, the reason why I underline it, this was supposed to be a place of, of worship where the presence of God dwelled. However, people misused the temple for their own reasons instead of the main purpose. This was an abuse of power and a major disrespect to God. Um, this was basically the temple that was planned by David and built by Solomon, but then rebuilt by Herod. I think that's how you say his name. 
And I'm actually going to show you some images of the temple because I have it in my archaeological Bible. But I'm going to quickly write these notes down. So, supposed to be... A place of worship. The people misuse the power and disrespected God's dwelling. Temple David plan Solomon built and her road rebuilt. I don't know if it's her road, Herod, I don't know. I'm going to say that one more time after I do this. And then I'm going to show you guys um, the actual images that I have of the temple. And I actually have these um, scanned and put on the printable. So you'll have it on the printable when I post it afterwards. But in the temple. So I almost forgot to do the, the color of the box. <laughs> Okay, so in the temple, this was supposed to be a place of worship, but people misused the power and disrespected God's dwelling place. This is a temple that David planned, Solomon built, and then Herod rebuilt. So I'm going to quickly show you guys in my archaeological Bible quickly. And I was like ecstatic to... Sorry about all the noise. <laughs> I was ecstatic to see it, and it's probably not going to be uh, easy to see. at the moment just because I have this so close but um oh my god okay let me see if I can fix the camera a bit eh. no it's not gonna work okay and I don't feel like taking it off so I'm going to uh -oh. I have to fix the tripod somehow Just bear with me for a second, guys. Ah, sorry about that, you guys. I'm just trying to get you guys to see it as best as I can. But, um, I guess this I have to do for now. But um, it's, it's a pretty big image. Um, so in this middle portion here, this is the temple that uh, Jesus went to during the Passover. This is it. Now, this is a temple on the mount in the time of Jesus. Uh, if you guys can see it. So this is the temple on the mount in the time of Jesus. Um, and then this is a temple that Jesus was going to to get rid of the uh money changers and stuff like that so it's an actual like, big place like i don't i want you, like you'll see it on the uh <laughs> on the front of i just wish i didn't have to zoom in so much and um apparently this part here is solomon's porch that's what they call it but then there's another page here that actually shows you the inner workings of the temple So, yeah, it, I'm going to have this, like I said, on the printable for you guys to see, but uh, it is, 
I wrote simple in the time of Jesus. <laughs> this is a big Bible compared to the ESV. But um so this part here is the in, is the upper chamber. This here is a curtain that separated um the presence of the I guess the Holy Spirit. The high priest would enter here once a year for the Day of Atonement. This up here is the inner sanctuary. And then this is the holy place that contained the lampstand and the table of bread of the presence and the altar of incense. So um, this is basically where Jesus was. This, this is it. And this is like the huge overview of like everything. So you can see how big this place is. Um, there was like the court of the Gentiles, the royal Susa. I'm sorry, the, the royal Stoa. You had small shops like down here. This is the triple gate and its stairways, the council hall for legal proceedings, the ritual bathhouse, um, the double gates, Robinson's Ark, Arch, sorry, Wilson's Arch. Um, you know, I, I just, I really, really like this. I, I have it in the uh, portable. So, yeah. I'll probably take a photo of it and post it in the group as well. Just because looking at it that way is not the best. But, okay. Let's fix this back to how I had it. Uh-oh. <laughs> okay. But... I just wanted to show you guys the temple quickly, but again, it's in the printable on pages six to seven of the printable because the printable is eight pages long and I'll post an image of the uh, pictures in the group afterwards, but okay, that's all I did for that verse 14 was in the temple. If you do have the archaeological Bible, because um, I know some of you guys did buy it, um, I have the page numbers written down on the printable. So moving on to 15, where he says, um, making a whip of quartz. I'm underlining that because it took time to make a whip. Um, you know, he, I'm, I'm sure he was angry and it does say that he was, but, um, you know, I'm sure he was angry as he saw what was going on. So for him to take his time to make a whip of cords, you know that he wasn't being rash, that he was careful and did not um, let his anger overtake him. So I'm going to write. He took his time. Anger did not rule And then he drove them all out. Let me use, I guess, gray. He drove them all out. Whoa, what just happened? Oh. Of the temple, I'm going to use gray for that. So he drove them all out of the temple. I'm just using gray. Is that in view? Okay, yes. So he drove them all out of the temple. He got rid of those that would tarnish the temple. He cleansed of its evil to purify once more.
cleansed and purified it. Then I have a cross reference, which is Malachi 3, 1 through 3. So Malachi 3, 1 through 3, I'm going to read it on my nook. So it reads, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. Even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming and who can stand even when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. So that first portion in verse 1 where it says he will prepare the way before me and um and the lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple that is what just basically took place jesus is going to the temple to cleanse it to purify it to um get rid of the evil get rid of the people that are tarnishing it that's exactly what he did just as it says in malachi 3 and 1 so you know prophecy is coming true the scripture is coming true um, the things that were written in the Old Testament are starting to take place. Moving on to verse 16. Um, where he says, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. Basically, God's house is not created for man to use for his own greed and power. It is a holy place to seek his presence. We should never defame it. This cleansing symbolized that the ceremonies and rituals were about to be replaced by his body, which would be the new temple. So I'm going to say that again. Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. God's house is not created for man to use for their own greed and power. It's a holy place to seek his presence. We should never defame it. This cleansing, the cleansing that was taking place in the temple, what he was doing with um, getting rid of the people that were tarnishing the money changers, the sheep, the oxen, all of that. This cleansing symbolized that the ceremonies and rituals, basically the old ways, the laws, were about to be replaced by his body, Jesus Christ, which would be the new temple, which would also be the new covenant. So, um, though it seems like it's not a lot to that phrase, when you break it down and really study it, you understand it a lot better. Um, and I do have a cross-reference for that as well. I'm going to actually write my notes on this paper here, so...
Okay, so what I wrote, sorry it took me so long. I just wanted to make sure I got it down. Um, okay, so God's house is not created for man's greed or power or to defame it. It's to worship and seek his presence. The cleansing symbolizes the old ways, laws, and temple preparing to be replaced by the new. And the cross reference I have for that is Jeremiah 7 and 11. So let me go to that. 7 and 11. And it reads, has this house, which is called my name, I'm sorry, has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of thieves in your eyes? Behold, even I have seen it, says the Lord. So God has seen it happen time and time again, where his temple, where his place, where his house has been defamed, has been used for um, just all types of shenanigans instead of what it was created to be for. So now he has Jesus going to do a big old cleansing of his temples. And especially the temple that was, you know, planned by David and then created by Solomon. You know, these are two of the greatest kings during the time, um, during the, the, the time that they did have kings that um, God considered to be men after his own heart. So they're defaming the very place that these men created. And he just was ready to clean house. That's pretty much how that was. For verse 15 about the temple. Sure, Evelyn. Um... Okay, so basically where it said that he drove them out. Hold on, let me go back to that. Cause... Um... Okay, so he drove them all out of the temple. Basically, he got rid of those that would tarnish the temple. He cleansed it of its evil to purify it once again. Um, the shorthand that I wrote was he got rid of those tarnishing the temple, cleansed and purified it. And then the cross reference was Malachi 3 verses 1 through 3. Okay, that's the shorthand that I wrote. So for verse 15 where it says um, he drove them all out of the temple... He got rid of those tarnishing the temple, cleansed and purified it in Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Okay. So, I'm going to move to verse 17 now. What time is it? It's 1259. Okay. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. Um, so. Zeal for your house will consume me. Is what I'm underlining. I'm going to write over here. So, zeal for your house will consume me. I'm sorry. So, um, Jesus had such an eager heart for God's house. This eagerness basically took hold of him um, sometimes. So, they got this scripture from... I think there was two of them. I just want to make sure I'm giving you the right one. Quickly... Let me out first. So, Jesus had an eagerness for God. That's and his house. Cross references are Psalm sixty nine, right? Sixty nine and nine. In Numbers and 13. So I'm going to read Numbers says, 
It shall be to him and his descendants after him a covenant of an everlasting priesthood because he was zealous for his God of Israel. Kind of reminds me of Jesus. Um, okay, sorry. So it kind of reminds me of Jesus because Jesus is very zealous for God. He And he's making that atonement for not just the children of Israel, but for all people at this time. And then I'm going to go to Psalm 69 and 9. It says, Because zeal for your house has eaten me up, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me, when I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, that became my reproach. So that's where that verse comes from. The verse itself comes from Psalm 69 and 9. I know that the uh, live did just have a slight interruption. I'm not sure if it popped up on you guys' end. But um, I know that it just had a, a slight interruption. You're welcome, Evelyn. I'm just seeing that. <laughs> You're welcome. Verse 18, what sign do you show us for, for doing these things? Is what I'm underlining. That's when the Jews were speaking to him. What signs do you show us for doing these things? Let me quickly go to my cross reference for that verse, which is... So with that, um, the Jews basically demanded a sign from Jesus to prove his authority. But the reality is that Jesus should never have to prove himself if you truly know who he is. So these are the Jews, you know, the people who, you know, are all like, we love Jesus, we love Christ. I'm not Christ. We love God. We know God. We know the word. These are the ones who believe in God. But you believe in God and you question his son. You don't know who his son is. So do you truly know who God is, is the question. So, um verse 18 right this is 18 yes this is verse 18 um jews demanded a sign from jesus to prove himself But he should never have to do so. Should never have to do so. If you truly know him. And love God. And then the cross reference is Exodus 4, verse 1, and then verse 8. So I'm going to read Exodus 4, verses 1 and 8. So verse 1 says, Then Moses answered, I'm going to actually read this in the East. So um, Exodus 4, verse 1, Then Moses answered, But behold, they will not believe me or listen voice for they will say the lord did not appear to you and then going to verse eight if they will not believe you god said or listen to the first sign they may believe the latter the latter sign sorry so if they will not believe you god said Or listen to the first sign, they may believe the latter sign. Sorry, you guys. I keep seeing that it says that it's getting interrupted. That's why I keep pausing. So I don't want it to be interrupted as I speak. So when I see that on my end, I pause. But, um, yeah. That is that.
Let's get silver. This is just a gorgeous brown color. I love that one. It's so nice. Um, okay, so moving on to 19. Where he says, um, destroy this temple. And in three days, I will rise it up. I'm underlining that. Because I think that's really, really important to know. Like, really important. Okay. Do I have a cross-reference for that? I do. Basically, um, in this verse, verse 19, Jesus is uh, foretelling his death and resurrection. The temple was a reference to his own body. So the cross reference is Acts 26, verse 23. And then I'm also going to say C note for verse 21. Because 21 also extends to that verse as well. But um, verse 19, destroy this temple and in three days I will rise it up. Basically, Jesus foretells his death. The temple was a reference to his own body. The cross reference is 26, um, Acts 26, verse 23, and it says that the Christ must suffer and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. Moving on to verse 20. So they say the Jews said it has taken 46 years to build this temple. So I'm going to underline that it has taken 46 years to build this temple. And then the part where it says, will you rise it up in three days? I'm going to also underline. So it has taken 46 years to build this temple. These men immediately stay carnal minded and they think of the amount of time it took them to build. It's all about themselves and it's not really about Jesus. Um, Jesus wasn't referring to the physical building, the physical temple. He was speaking of his temple, meaning his body. He was foretelling his coming death and resurrection. He was really in a spiritual kind of realm Whereas these men, they stay calm, hey guys. So, the uh, live video session had cut off because my phone had actually died. I was I was not paying attention to it being charged. So, it died. And I was going to go back on and do the live. Um, but I know that there was interruptions before. So, I already downloaded the first two hours of the session. Just in case it decides to delete like it did last time. And um, I'm just now recording this session and then I'll upload it, this session separately in the group and then edit everything together for YouTube. But um, we left off at verse 20 where it says it has taken 46 years to build this temple. And what I was saying is that they stayed carnal minded. Um, it was all about them and not really understanding who Jesus was. So I'm going to finish my note. Um, they stayed carnal minded. And made it about them. And then the second half of that says, will you raise it up in three days? Sorry, you can't see it. Will you raise it up in three 
days and I'm trying to just open up my notes again <laughs> Um, okay, so this now they're questioning his power. They're, they're, you know, they're like, okay, how can you raise it up in three days? You're just but, a, you're, you're but a man. So not only are they carnal minded, not only are they making it about them, but they clearly don't, clearly don't know who he is because now they're questioning his power and authority that he has. So, um, they question his power. Oh, yeah, and you guys, that little uh, pen case I was talking about, it did come in the mail, actually, once the live session stopped. So, here is the case itself. It's pretty big. I'm actually going to do a whole setup video on this on YouTube, so I'm going to probably record that later on. I want to get this set up, but I love it so much, and uh, I'm going to post a picture when I have a setup and tag the... Um, tag her the, the the girl who who had this in her videos i can't remember her actual name i saw her comment and leave um her verse mapping but i know her ig account is counting the cost ministries i know that for a fact and also her youtube channel um so yeah i have to thank her for posting that because i have found that and i'm probably gonna order a second one like i said in the gray because it's so stinking pretty but yeah okay so moving on, um, the next one we're going to go to is verse 21, where it says, but he was speaking about the temple of his body. So he was speaking about the temple of his body. Let's use purple, 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 because, you know, Jesus is royal. God is royal. Um, verse 21. Oh, and I did go in and add, like, extra paper <laughs> between every um, page of the Bible. So, there's, like, two sheets in each because I noticed from the first session we had with John chapter 1, it was just a lot of notes. So, I went and just, to be on the safe side, <laughs> I just did that. But, um, okay, so he was speaking about the temple of his body. Jesus looked beyond the physical. He knew the temple wouldn't last and that he himself was a temple for the Father. He confidently claimed the resurrection power even before men truly understood it. As believers, we need to understand that our bodies are also temples that the Holy Spirit dwells in. I do have cross references, which I will get to. But um, so I'm going to state it again. Jesus looked beyond... The physical realm. He knew the temple, the building in parentheses, wouldn't last, and that. He would become the temple for God. Christians need to understand. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And I also said that um, Jesus confidently claimed the resurrection power before people even knew it. Um, but the cross references I have are 1 Corinthians, I think it's 619, nine, six sorry. And then Colossians 2.9. So I'm going to quickly read that in the ESV translation. Um, and I'm just going to check that out on my nook, which I have here with me. So 1 Corinthians 6.19. 
and it reads, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Um, and this was more so about talking about sexual immorality um, and stuff like that, but it still works even when you're not talking about sexual immorality. When you're just defaming your body, when you're cutting yourself, when you want to commit suicide, when you are... Um, doing all types of crazy things to your body which you put input into your body food wise what you put into your mind you know from watching tv and songs like all of that really encompasses a temple that the holy spirit is in and is that really benefiting the holy spirit like you know we, we like me i used to love what i call ratchet monday on tv because um vh1 would have love and hip-hop and all that crazy stuff and i used to like watch it faithfully you guys like i used to love watching it because i thought it was so funny to see these people get on tv and act a hot mess but over i think the past two years now um it's it hasn't really been entertaining me like when i watch it i actually feel bad for these women and these men that get on this show because they're like putting their whole lives out there but they're also looking crazy like i i don't know i just i can't seem to watch it i'll watch it in like inklands with my mother but it's just something about the show now that when I watch it, my spirit just does not, it doesn't sit well with it. Um, and the same thing goes with hip-hop music. Like, I love me some Chris Brown. I like Trey songs. I love hip-hop and R&B music. That's the type of music I like. That baby-making music that they call it, you know, the slow jams and all that. I love that type of music just because um, my, my, my family is very musical. My brother, he plays, my, both my brothers are musician. My sister sings. I used to sing. Um, I still can. I just prefer not to sing. I dance. Um... You know, we're very musical, we're very artistic. Music is my life. Um, but just listening to certain songs, it really, literally, there's a ringing in my ear. Like, if I listen to too much hip-hop and R&B after a certain time, my, my ear literally starts to ring. And um, it, it's insane. So I know the Holy Spirit is doing something because I, I'm beginning to understand that though this is my body, like this body is mine, it's really not mine because I have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in me. And um, this is also just a, a, a meat suit in a sense. Like I'm renting this meat suit from God. Like I'm renting it from God because he's He's going to take it back. So I'm, I'm starting to just understand a lot as far as my body as a temple and understanding it fully. Um, not just when it just comes to sex, obviously, when it comes to other things as far as like the things that I input into my body, the foods that I'm drinking. Um, I like wine. I do. And as a teen, I used to drink. But now I understand that, you know, I can have a cup of wine or two, but don't drink to the point of being drunk or like, you know, I drink for the taste of it, um, for the enjoyment of it, not to be a crowd pleaser or people pleaser or whatever the case may be. Um, and even when it comes to food, you know, I'm, I'm understanding. I'm the opposite type of person. Um, I don't like to eat. And that sounds crazy. But um, for me, I'm an emotional eater in that if, if I'm upset or I'm sad or I'm angry, I don't have an appetite. Um, and I know that sounds weird because when you're an emotional eater, you eat when you're like in those feelings. But I'm the opposite type of emotional eater. And I'm learning that I can't continue to do that because I'm making myself sick. I'm making myself tired. And um, it's not good because God has a work for me to do. And um, in order for me to do that work, I need to be able to function properly. And to function properly, I have to eat properly, not just eating snacks. Because I get angry I, I just I literally lose my entire appetite but I will eat snacks and um, it's just not good so just understanding that your body is a temple to the Holy Spirit and belongs to God is key so moving on to Colossians um, 2 and 9 it says for in him whole I'm sorry for in him the holy full the whole fullness of the deity dwells bodily so for in him meaning for in christ jesus the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily um and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority so again it's just talking about jesus um and the indwelling of god within him like we have the holy spirit but his indwelling is actually god like you know he is god in him we have the holy spirit in christ in us but um okay so moving on to 22 yes so moving on to 22, um, when therefore he was raised from the dead, I'm underlining that, his disciples remembered that he had said this, underlining that, 
and they believe scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. I'm underlining that. So we got a lot of underlines going on. Lots and lots. So, and when therefore he was raised from the dead. Let me use my zebras. I'm going to use the cool pack from the zebra mile liners for this. Um, starting with this luscious gray color. Just luscious in all its gloriousness. You know, I'm actually going to order me a, a gray pen because I'm finding that I like to use gray in my color code system now. Like, I don't know. When I read things in books, I, I like to use gray a lot now. So, um, and let's use this kind of like red color. It's like a reddish pink. All right. So, I'm going to actually write on the rest of this post-it because I started writing on it and didn't finish. <laughs> so, I'm going to finish. But, um, so this is verse 22. So the part says, when therefore he was raised from the dead. Um, this is a reference to Jesus' death. I mean, this is a reference to after his death and resurrection. Um, and what I mean, that this is like after the time when, if you remember, um, Mary had went to tomb and found that his body wasn't there this is after all of that happened that they are referring to so john is actually referring john the apostle not john the baptist john the apostle is now um talking about the events that would take place toward the end of this book in the bible um so i'm just going to my cross reference quickly okay so um Reference to after Jesus's death and resurrection, the cross reference is going to be Psalms sixteen and ten. Um, and that basically reads. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. So basically at this time, um, it's just saying that, you know, God didn't abandon Christ after he died. He resurrected him. He brought him back um, from the depths of hell so that he wouldn't be corrupted. Um, to the next part where it says his disciples remembered that he had said this. Basically, the disciples would remember the time that Jesus spoke of his death and resurrection. So they remember; they would remember um, all the times that he foretold his death and resurrection. They would remember all his foretellings. And then the last part says they believe the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Um, let me just decline that phone call because I'm not going to be interrupted again. <laughs> um, so they believe the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. After having remembered and seen it come to pass, they would believe in Jesus whom they walked with for years and spent intimate time with. Um, so it's kind of like the situation like when you know someone and, you know, you hear what they say and you know the type of person they are, but you don't really fully believe it until you, like, witness it in person. Kind of like that kind of situation. Um, these these are men that walked with Jesus. I mean, they they were his friends. And then you had his inner circle, uh, which were Peter, John, I think James. Peter, John, and James were his, like, inner circle. Um, and of all the people in the world, they just, they didn't fully believe in him. And, I mean, for me personally, as I read through the Gospels, I've read John, i read Luke, and I'm in Mark right now. As I seriously read through the Gospels, it pisses me off <laughs> to no avail at how ignorant these disciples were. I mean, everyone else outside of the disciples were quick to believe him. But it's saying now that they believe the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken when he was raised from the dead. Like, it took all of that for y'all to really, truly believe him. 
I, it blows my mind. Like, it truly blows my mind. But, um... You know, it, it, it blows my mind. I don't know. Like, because it was easy for the women. Because I, I read a lot, like, when I was reading Luke, that a lot of the women were quick to believe Jesus. Like, when he said something, they believed him. They they were by him. They stuck by him. But the men, his own disciples, it took them some time to really catch up with the women. And that, I think that's, like, just mind-blowing to me. I don't know. But um, I'm going to write, they would believe... And him, who they were intimate, and I don't mean that kind of intimate, because I know when I post this on YouTube, somebody might laugh or whatever the case may be. But I mean like a intimacy as far as being friends, almost being like brothers type of intimacy, not a romantic intimacy. Just want to reiterate that because I do post my my videos up, and I do have um, teenagers that do watch my um videos as well. So just felt that I had to reiterate that. <laughs> But they would believe in him who they were intimate with. After seeing him resurrected. And the cross reference for that is um Second Peter one twenty. And it reads, knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. So, when you interpret scripture, you should never allow it to just be yourself that interprets scripture. It should be the Holy Spirit helping you to interpret scripture. God should be helping you to interpret scripture, not just yourself. And um, with them just now believing after he's resurrected... To me, it sounds insane. I personally feel like they should have believed him from the start when he first opened up his mouth and when he first started his ministry. But it also takes God's perfect timing and the, the revelation from the Holy Spirit for one to truly believe in Jesus and the word. So, you know, to me, in my mind, they're crazy. They should have just believed. But with the way the Holy Spirit works and the way that God works, it was perfect in how it happened. So, you know, that is that. And then we're going to move on to the last three verses, which are 23 to 25. I'm going to quickly read through those. I don't think I have anything here that I needed to define. Let me just go back to the definitions quickly. Yes, there is one. So, I'm um, reading that through. It says, now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and he needed no one to bear witness about man for he himself knew what was in man. So the only word that I have is entrust. And though like I know what it means, I don't know what it meant at that time or even the English definition of it. Because you know how sometimes, like, you know a word, but you don't really know the English definition of a word? Like, I can give you the Sinead understanding of a word, but I can't give you the Webster's dictionary word, like, definition. So, I had definitely wanted to look that word up for myself just to know it. And, um, let's use this color. So, in trust... Um, in Hebrew, and sorry, not Hebrew, in Greek. So all the words we are defining in the Gospel of John are Greek words. I want you guys to understand that um, the New Testament was written in Greek. So when I do define these words, I look up the English and the Greek definition. Okay? Just wanted to, to get that out the way because I know a lot of people ask me, um, is it Hebrew? I can't find it in the Hebrew. But do not look up these words in the Hebrew. Look it up in the Greek because... The gospel according to John was written in Greek. Um, all of the New Testament was written in Greek because a lot of it was written at the time of like the conversions and stuff with the Gentiles and the Christians and Jews and all that. So um, the word Greek word is P-I-S-T-E-U-O. Yes, I don't know how to say that word, but that's the word and it means to believe have faith in 
or trust. And Okay, so and trust means in the Greek to believe in, have faith in, or trust in. Okay, got that out of the way. So, many believed in him. In his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. I'm underlining that. So that's kind of like a superficial faith that people had. Um, it was based on the admiration of his wondrous things. They didn't truly understand but were awestruck by his words. Um, not his words, by his works. So um, I'm going to actually do this with... Uh, this green color here no I'm not I hate I don't I don't like when colors clash um, I'm just I'm just one of those people that just doesn't like colors clashing and what I mean by that is that if I would have used this green color it would have clashed with that color sorry if you guys can see that it would have clashed with this kind of color here and I just I, I don't care for that um, that's just the uh, artist in me I guess <laughs> But, oops, sorry you guys. I'm going to write that on this. So that is verse 23. Many believed in his name when they saw the signs he was doing. This is superficial. Superficial. All struck by his works. So that's all I'm writing is that this was superficial and it's all struck by his works. That's it. Verse 24. Jesus on his own part did not entrust himself to them. So I'm going to underline Jesus on his own part did not entrust himself to them. I'm going to also underline what it says he knew all people. And I'm going to keep going to 25 where it says needed no one to bear witness about man. He himself knew what man was. So now I'm going to take the um, fluorescent pack from the zebra mouth liners um and it's like these neons and i mean these are neons you guys this orange is insane um but i'm gonna start with pink i'm gonna use it for this one he himself new man this kind of teal color he knew all people use the blue for jesus did on did not entrust himself on them and then I'm going to use this yellow for that. Okay. Mm. Alrighty then, let's write my notes out. So, Jesus did not, I'm sorry, Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them. So basically, Jesus didn't have faith in the kind um of belief that they had he came to do a work not create a show he didn't need the approval of man so he did not have faith sorry so he did not have faith in the kind of belief They had, he came to do a work, not a show. Mm. 
Sorry, guys. I have my muffins here because I'm just, like, really hungry. And then he knew all people. He's omniscient. That's, that's pretty much it. I think next time I think I'm gonna get a um a soft covered journaling Bible because the hard covers are good until you need to like really get in then I end up writing sloppy. I don't like that. Um, needed no one to bear witness about man. Sorry, it's right here. So, uh, needed no one to bear witness about man. Jesus did not need for someone to tell him about mankind. He was, of course, the divine word. So, he was... Sorry, he was the divine word. needed no witness of a man And then he himself knew what was in man. So basically, he was there at the beginning of creation and he saw the fall of man. He knew what was said. I'm sorry. He knew what was and is in humanity and still loved us enough to be born on earth in flesh to save us from ourselves. And I have cross references. So I'm actually going to write that over here because I want to write that whole thing out. So verse 25. And let me just put these back. Um, I'm so excited to set up my little pin case. Oh my gosh. And I might really order a second one today. Like, really might do that. Um, let me take these notes. And stick them back here. So for verse 25, the part where it says he himself knew what was in man. He was there. In the beginning. Of creation. Witness the fall he knew what was and is in humanity and still loved us So loved us enough to be born on 
on earth and flesh to save us. God bless you, brother. How you doing? <sighs> Sorry, you guys. Hold on. Um, to save us, and then I have Jeremiah 17 and 10 as a cross-reference. And also Acts 15 and 8. So I'm going to go to Jeremiah right now. 17 and 10. And that verse actually pops up a lot throughout my study. But, um... I see the Lord, I'm sorry, I the Lord search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. So, Jesus knows man, and then we have Acts 15 and 8. And if you even want to take it further, I would even say Genesis 126. And that's one that I just thought of. But um, Acts 15 and 8 says, And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. Um, and then I'm going to read Genesis 126, but a lot of you should know that verse already. Um, but 126 reads, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Simple as that. I'm going to say 126a. Because God is speaking to himself, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Um, so, you know, he already knows what is in man. He knows who man is. He knows everything there is to know about us. But um, that's pretty much it for as notes. So I'm just going to quickly do a quick summary. So um, basically, chapter 2 was um, all about the first miracle being performed, Jesus cleansing the temple, and him foretelling his coming death and resurrection. Uh, his first miracle of turning water into wine really did not showcase his power. Um, Jesus was not a man of theatrics. He spoke when it was truly necessary, and he sought out those true in heart to help him. Jesus was a mighty and powerful man. He was God, yet he never let his power stop him from being around those less than him. Chapter 1 really focused on Jesus as the word and the witness of four people about him. While this chapter begins with his ministry, we also see a great example of great faith and obedience to Christ in verses 7 and 9 with the servants at the at the um, wedding with them listening. So they believed and obeyed before the miracle was produced, which allowed them to partake in the joy of the miracle being done. And when I say that, it's, it's interesting because um, a lot of us say we'll, we believe and we will obey God before the miracle is produced. But then we don't do anything. And before the miracle can be produced, we have to put some type of effort on our end. Now, it's not in our own strength and our own effort that it gets done. But when God sees that we are putting in the effort to do the work, he then does the rest of the work for us. So I just thought that was really, really interesting to um, see. And then again, on pages 6 and 7 of the printable, um, I have the two images of uh, the temple and the mount on the temple. I have those posted. And they are scanned. They're not the best copies. That's why I'm going to take photos and post it in the group as well. But um, if you do have the ESV Archaeological Study Bible, it is on page 1473. So page 1473. And then on pages 1,544 and 45. But um, that's pretty much it. The next session will be on um, next Thursday. Which will be August. August, 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 August. I need to find my calendar because I don't have my calendar correctly up right now. Calendar. So August 2nd will be the next session. Um, they'll be every Thursday. Um because Thursdays are just they're they're working out um I may switch between Thursdays and Tuesdays every now and then so I'll just definitely keep you guys posted for now they're going to be Thursdays um because that's when my son won't be home <laughs> and yeah it'll be a 10 a 10 a.m eastern we'll, we'll start about 10 or 5 a.m eastern but I will get on at 9 45 a.m eastern to play some gospel music Christian music just to set the atmosphere for myself personally so that my mind can um be in the right condition as well as for you guys just you know here because some a lot of the songs i pick i ask the holy spirit to guide me in picking the songs and um i'm normally in here singing the songs to myself in tears boohoo crying because the songs really do minister to me 
But um, yeah, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, definitely leave them down below in the comment section. Um, just yeah, and there are questions on here now. The questions on the printables you don't have to like answer. They're just for you to just further help you understand the word and what you're reading. But um, yeah, that is it for chapter two we will knock out chapter three hopefully and it probably not now that i'm looking at it chapter three might take two sessions but um yeah we're done with chapter two so quickly again here's a quick overview of the notes that we have taken with um the three sticky notes on the back one two three and then the other notes which are here and here so there's a lot of note taking printables are available like i said the printable will be posted shortly but um i just wanted to get this video up for you ladies to see and i'll be editing all of this tonight to post onto youtube tomorrow so that's about it and i'll see you guys in the next video bye mm -hmm.